What is up, Buffalo Fanatics, man? As promised, man, special guest for JTM today, Buffalo Fanatics, Pro Bowl cornerback Antonio Camardi. Now, what's going on, man? I don't know if many of y'all in Buffalo Fanatics world know that I'm a huge FSU fan, man. So <laughs> I've been watching Kamari for a long time, man. Um, and and for the people who don't know, FSU is the true DBU. Okay. Yeah, it, yes, it is. Don't get it mistaken. Now, so if y'all can see my pendant right here, still got my Florida State pendant on, ready to rock. All right. How you doing, man? How's yeah, everything I'm going? I'm just doing good, man. What's happening? Not much, man. You know, right now it's a uh, it's a crazy time, and um. Buffalo right now. Obviously, the draft coming up. Obviously, you know a thing or two about that being a top pick. You were. Um, <laughs> a lot of options on the table. So, man, we got we got some questions for you to uh, to answer for us today, man. Give us a, some insight. All right, I'm I'm down with it. All right. So, first question is this, man. You were drafted by the Chargers in the first round. Uh -huh. All right. Now, what most people don't know is that you tore your ACL your last year at FSU and were out, correct? Yes. So, Antonio rehabbed his ACL within eight months. Did, didn't go to the scouting combine, but was ready no, for a pro day. No, no, no. I ran, I, ran, I ran at the combine. Did you run? Yeah, I ran 4 4 1 at the combine. Were you fully recovered by then? No, I was only like six months. Six months uh, removed. I Dang. did. Uh, I did. I did the. Uh, what I did was I did broad jump. I did my forty, and I did the DB drills, and okay. then I did, and then I did, I did my vertical. Okay. Uh, everything else I didn't want to do because I wanted another month for my ACL, which my trainer was saying, you know, get another month for your ACL until you, you can do everything, L drill and all that stuff. So. Okay. Okay, so you run a four four one at the combine six months, six months out, six months right? out. Then you're then taken by the Chargers in the first round. Yep. Now you joined a pretty good Chargers a Charger team at that point in time. I know stuff about. I mean, I had on the defense side of the ball, I had Jamal Williams, I had uh, Steve Foley. As a matter of fact, that's who got shot. That was my rookie year. Um. John, Sean Phillips, Merriman, um, man, the list, uh, Randall Godfrey, uh, Donnie Edwards. So, I mean, I had a, I had a veteran, a veteran group on the back, I want to say in the front, in the front seven. And then, you know, I had from Marlon McCree to Jammer to Dre Florence to Clinton Hart. You know, I had a lot of guys on the back end. That I mean, for me, made my job a whole lot easier. I mean, we even had you know Terrence Kill uh, at that point in time too. Right. So, who were some of the guys when you came into lead that it definitely helped you 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 learn? I know you guys had a young Philip Rivers too, right? Yeah, you know Philip. My first year there was Philip's first year as a starter. Right. So uh, we had just got they had just got rid of uh, Drew Brees because whole thing talking about his shoulder, but. Uh, so that was my first year. Uh, Phillips' first year start was my was my rookie year. Okay. Okay. Now, you came into league under a veteran coach in Marty Schottenheimer. Yes. Um, I know for me, a lot of Bills fans, we can we compare Sean McDermott automatically to Marv Levy, obviously because Marv Levy's the last great head coach of Buffalo. Yeah. For me, the way that Doug, Doug um, Sean McDermott runs his team. I compare him to Marty Schottenheimer and Marty Ball. Marty Ball, run, 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 run the clock out. Run the clock. Let the defense make the plays. Don't turn it over. True, I can see that. But you know what? But but you also got to think about this. Like I I like I like Tyrod Taylor a little bit. But think about if he had a quarterback that was more precise, more get the ball down the field a lot better. What would happen? Do you Definitely. think you still? Do you think you still would play Marty Ball then? You know what? 
I, you know, that's a good question, man. I really don't. Like I said, if for McDermott, he don't have a track record of, of being a head coach. But at the same time, he does come from Andy Reid, and Andy Reid doesn't don't Randy Reid doesn't play Marty Ball. No. So that's that's something you got to think about too. Was it was it green light, red light for Tyrod Taylor because he only knew what he had, or you know what I'm saying? Because when I mean, watching the games, the game was never cut loose for Tyrod Taylor. They never right. let him take control of the offense. You could tell everything was dictated, run pass, short pass, medium pass. I mean, I think this past year, I think he only threw, what, 20 passes over 20 yards? Maybe, yeah. Maybe or less? Yeah. So does that, does that play into the coach itself, or does that play into the player of how they put them on handcuffs? You know what? At the end of the day, I I think it has to be the, I think it has to be the player, because Rick Dennison was on record saying multiple times that he didn't feel like he was getting what he wanted out of the offense essentially, and you could tell by the play calling that some of those plays, even in the sequences, he didn't want to call, but he had to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it, it's just all about your players. Your offense dictates to your players. So I, I believe it'll be something totally different this year from, court, from quarterback-wise, from Tyrod Taylor to what you guys have now. Trust me. So, question, did you ever get to, did you ever get to play against A.J. McCarron? Never get, I never had a chance to play against him. Do you think he's an automatic upgrade from, Ty, from Tyrod Taylor? what we're trying to do here. Yeah, from a guy that can read defenses and understand the defense, yes. Because, I mean, when I talk to you, I go to list of quarterbacks that you've played with. You've played with a young Mark Sanchez. You've played with a Phil Rivers. You've played with Ryan Fitzpatrick. You've played with an Andrew Luck. So if you've seen multiple quarterbacks and how they prepare and what you can do as an offense. So I'm definitely going to take your word for it if you're going to say, hey, Ty- you could just definitely upgrade over Tyrod Taylor. I mean, if you look at the way that uh, McCarron played when uh, when Andy Dalton got hurt. Trust me, it's it's a whole lot better. All right, so we're gonna say AJ McCarron up great. So now you were on that Jets team, right? When they traded up to get Mark Sanchez. Yeah. Well, no, you know what? I came in after the first year. Okay. After the first year. Okay. So. So you got to see Mark Sanchez's development. Um there we have picks 12 and 22 and it's rumored that we've been trying to move up for the longest time now um to possibly get a darno or rosen or um maybe a lamar jackson is there any quarterback that's coming out of this draft that you look up and you say wow and there's, nope. a, is there a quarterback in this draft you say huh i'll intercept him very easily <laughs> uh that's that's probably every quarterback that's uh, that's in the draft right now yeah yeah, because, I mean, you don't have an Andrew Luck. You don't have a Russell Wilson. Um, you don't you don't have a Matt Ryan in, a, in that draft. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't – You I, to me, I don't see that. And and them, that's that's coming out of the draft. Now, what Lamar Jackson gives you is a different element of the game because he's a running pass threat, period. You know, ball in his hand, he's a threat no matter what. So he can throw the ball down the field. He can put the ball on the money. I mean, to me, to me, he's the best quarterback in the draft. That's just me being honest. I don't care nothing about the quarterback from UCLA and the quarterback from um, USC. Man, they, they are not. They are not that good. Just watching film. Right. So if you had to pick right now, you're picking Lamar just, Jackson over all of them. I, I'm taking Lamar Jackson. I like Lamar Jackson because of what he can do, and I saw what he, you know what I'm saying? Like, he, he brings a, just a totally different element to the game. I like the kid, uh, what's the kid from Oklahoma, Mayfield? Mayfield, yeah. Man, I like Mayfield. But it's his swagger, though. It's his, 
it's his whole demeanor. Like he has that I'm not gonna lose type attitude no matter what's going on in the game. Like I don't see that in any of those other quarterbacks they they consider as being top top draft picks in the NFL. Now, the funny thing about Baker Mayfield, I know we we visit with Mayfield, I think, six times um during this draft process. But it's rumored yeah. that the Jets are are almost it's almost a done deal that they're gonna take him at number three. You think he's he's okay for his temperament in that market? I just hope I just hope he's not a, a, a Ryan Leaf. That's what worries me is his temperament is if things start going bad, will it spiral for him? You know what I mean? Um, because I feel like having that chip on your shoulder can also lead to your downfall time. I think you have to be find a balance um, within on something like that. Well, you got to think about the balance in it. I mean, the whole the balance of the whole thing is making sure he has the right people around him to make sure that when he's talking, like I I believe that with the uh, uh, I believe with the right people around him, like I believe like with the Jets, they're doing a lot better job of protecting younger guys when they're talking in the media and all that stuff. Um, so. A lot of stuff can be persuaded. A lot of stuff can be not talked about. And at the end of the day, like, people take people's attitude after a loss as, oh, he just, uh, he's just, you know, he's just a selfish player, this and that. He don't care anything about talking to the media. No, nah, man, we just lost. Now I got to try to sit here and prepare the next week. You know, as a, and as a franchise quarterback, that's something you have to deal with week in and week out because everyone's going to look to you no matter what. So if he can handle himself in a way that makes him not be a, 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 a prick, then, yeah, it'll be, it'll be good for him. But being in the New York market, ain't, there's, not, there's nothing never good that come out of the New York market besides advertisement. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I hear I'm that. Being, I'm just being honest. If you have a cocky attitude, they're going to eat you alive. All right. So if you think Lamar is the best quarterback in the draft, you think Mayfield has the best attitude, me, I, I'm hearing a lot about Josh Allen. Me, I am not a fan of Josh Allen. I'll put that on the record. I, I don't feel like you can fix the issues he has. Um, I understand the arm strength and whatever this fingertip speed that they just came out with. We seem like they come out with something new every draft process. Don't let oh, they come somebody up. Yep. I'm not a fan of them. The man, the man had one offer coming out of high school. Okay, he went to JUCO. He threw 40, completed 49% of his passes in JUCO, and never completed more than I think 55% in a in in a at Wyoming. Yep. Um, do you think that that's something that could be corrected, or are they going to use this kid as a battering ram as far as like putting him part of the running game? Uh, be honest with you, uh, the kid Josh Allen, man. I when I watched him early on during the year, he was he was showing me something, but then it just kind of like trickled off. You know, like I understand you have a bad game, but you can't put three, four bad games together. And that you're you're definitely right. At, at the end of the day, when someone is, you can't you're not passing higher than 55%, you're not completing more than 55% of your passes, something's wrong. Right. Like something, something's not right. That's a project. That's just like the whole thing with Christian Hackenberg in New York. Why draft him in the second round? Right. You're right. It, it's a project. And I think Christian Hackenberg was more refined than what coming out than what Josh Allen is now. Nah, I didn't see that. You don't think so? No. <laughs> Heck no. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, time's going to tell, man. But like I said, I feel like the NFL is an egotistical league, man. And every coach feel like they can they can fix something. And I, I feel like, man, if you pick this kid Josh Allen in the top five, somebody's going to lose their job in a year or two, man. I, I that's just that's my general feeling on it. I you can't fix accuracy. It's been proven over time that you really can't fix accuracy. You can improve it for you can. Stre stretches of time, but 
trust me, you you can you can fix accuracy. That's just intermediate short passes, not really throwing the ball down the field. Everything is on three step pop and throw or five step pop and throw, shotgun pop and throw. You can fix it. That's that's it's just doing it in practice compete you know what I'm saying? But that's that's also having a great coaching staff that's behind you that can make sure that you know what I'm saying, you can you they're gonna push you to that point. You can fix accuracy. But it's also that person willing to do it every single day, day in and day out. Right. Yeah. Now I got another question for you, man. Now you played on some pretty damn good secondaries in your career. You played with Reeves. You played with Reeves. Say, say that again. I can hear you, JT. You broke I'm, up. I'm sorry. I said you played on some pretty damn good secondaries in your day. Um yeah. with Reeves and yourself and um Quentin Jammer uh yeah. and other players. Now Patrick Peterson and uh, Tyron Matthew and all those guys. Yeah. Those are some pretty good secondaries. Now mind yeah. you, you shined in every single one. <laughs> now, knowing that when Sean McDermott first got here, the first thing he did was revamp our secondary. He signed Micah Hyde. He signed Jordan Poyer. Um, he uh, he drafted Tredavious White. And, I mean, I thought them boys played pretty lights out last year. They built this, this, our team out a lot. What do you see when you see that, when you see our secondary? Well, honestly, man, I've when I watched you guys, I, like, I love the, I love uh, Tredarius White. Like that young kid gonna be something special. He just can't. He just can't get content with where he's at. He has to continue to play. That's theirs. Um, I don't have no idea. Uh, he has. You know what I'm saying. He just can't get content with where he's at in in football. Okay. You know, and 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 understand that when it's time to go, it's time to go. Week in, week out, every single day, from film study to. Um, to to practice, you know what I'm saying? Like people understand like games are won in practice, not 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 on game day. Games are won in the film room. So if he understands that part about the film room, he can go he can go out and go do whatever you want to go do. Um uh the kid that surprised me the most was um what's the kid? Uh what's his name? Poor uh Poyer? Poyer. Jordan Poyer. He surprised me the most. So, I mean to me when he came from Cleveland, he was up in, to me. It was a special teams kid, right? And to play the way he played just shows you that they didn't use him the way that they needed to, or they because uh, this kid came and played lights out, and that's all you can ask for from a guy that came from a guy being a special teams guy, becoming a starter, and then not coming over to Buffalo, learning the new defense that that basically fits him. And that's all it's about, a guy that can fit the system and understands and buys into the system also. Now, saying that, right, with the system fit, because we, like you said, we saw that with Jordan Poyer. And what a lot of people don't realize about Poyer is the last year, his last year in Cleveland, they finally switched him to safety yeah. from corner. And he yep. was playing real, but then he got hurt and lacerated his spleen and was out for the whole season, the rest yep. of the season. Knowing that scheme fit is so important, how important is scheme fit with the quarterback position? Because this is a debate that goes back and forth all the time. Well, you gotta have to have that quarterback that fits the system. I think most guys be like, "Oh, you know, I'm just gonna buy. I'm just gonna get the best player at that point in time." Sometimes that don't work. That's that player that never fits the system. Uh, but it's also that guy bought into that system too, and understanding that system and not having too many coaching changes. The way the NFL is now, the coaching changes changes just as much as players change now. So um, that's that's another big thing. So you, they, we got to understand that. Like people get so mad with young quarterbacks, like oh he's he's trash, he's this, he's that. But how many offensive coordinators has he had? How many? You know what I'm saying? In his right. short term. So it's it's all about the coaching style staying together and keeping core guys to build him up from the running backs to skill positions also keeping up standing right by keeping the uh by having a nice offensive line you can't protect the young quarterback i mean so you can't have a young quarterback just going out there and getting knocked around he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna look a mess he's gonna look terrible he's gonna look like a draft bus so right. it's just it's just understand like the system plays a big part of it but 
like I always said with Mark Sanchez, if he if you would have kept the core guys around him, he would have improved every single year. So you think what you're saying is pretty much a lot of times it's not necessarily always the player skill set or the player skill level. It's they're building around them the system that he's in, the the yeah, road, you, uh, the turnover. Yeah, you have you have to build around because to me, all right, let me give you a, a prime example. 2010, 2011 season, we go, we go as the Jets, we go to the AFC Championship game. I mean, say we make it to the AFC Championship game two years in a row with Mark Sanchez. 2011, you get rid of, you get rid of players, you get rid of the core, you get rid of the core players. 2012, same thing. 2013, he's not, he's not playing because Rex Ryan wanted to throw him in the fire. Because he wanted to win uh, a preseason game against the Giants, you know what I'm saying? So it's not only that, but you bring in Tim Tebow, like for what? Like you could have used that five million dollars to pay somebody else, or three million. How much? How much you pay to bring in another another receiver for him, or a top notch receiver for him to help him out on the short intermediate media routes? You know, so it's just little things like that. It's just be like, come on, man, what, what are you guys doing? Right. You know what? And it's funny that you say Rex Ryan because I was I was we had Rex here for two years. Yeah. Um and there, and obviously, you know, when when Brett when Brett when Rex comes to town, Rex comes to town. He's oh, gonna yeah. let you know he's coming, he's gonna let you know he there. <laughs> Definitely. Um, thing is when you Thank guys you, when you guys started making changes towards the end there, um, like you say, throw him into fire trying to win a preseason game versus the Giants. Do you feel like there's pressure that comes down from up top, and then now now he, he creates like maybe a little chaotic situation. Maybe create maybe make somebody coaches come out their comfort zone, do things that they normally would not do. Because like I said, at the end of the day, jobs are on the line. But you know what? It's pressure that comes from up top, but just as much as that coach job is on the line, there's 53 guys plus another 10 guys. Appreciate you. Yeah, right. I'm sorry, JC. Hold on. Yep, no problem. Take your time, bro. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I probably have to ask the wife. I know. Did you? Are you getting? Like I said, for anybody who's just tuning in, catch on late. We are me, JTM from Buffalo tonight. We are live right now with Pro Bowl cornerback Antonio Cromartie. He's breaking down the quarterback position, some of the ins and outs of uh, how these teams are run, and possibly our some of our future situations. We went over the D backs of our team. So like I said, man, we're breaking a lot of things down, so you definitely want to tune in. And if you caught it late, you're definitely going to re want to replay this when we are done. Are you going to be able to? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, let's have a I'm going to get you an invitation. All right. Thanks, Rob. My bad, JT. Yeah, no problem, bro. But um, go back to your question again. Um, as far as the pressure, like when like when situations yes. come down, you know, in there's expectation from ownership and man upper management, that pressure coming down on co the coaching staff, does it cause them to do things that they normally would not do, make different changes that they may it, not make? You know what? It, it it does. It comes not just from I mean, it comes from GMs, it comes from the owner, from their their player, their draft picks, who they who they want to play and all of that stuff. Um, but you got to think about this. At the end of the day, like, everybody's in this for the same thing. I should go out and go try to win a championship again, or at least give another – at least build a team that will be have the possibilities of doing that. And to me, you can never have that if you don't keep those core guys around. If your team – your, if your locker room is changing, if, you're, if, you're, if your players change 30% and you bring it in 30% you – no, know, new guys and that's 30 percent of your team what is that going to do right see to, see, see to me the nfl is all about getting cheaper and not getting better so you get right. rid of you get rid of a lot of guys because they feel a lot of pressure like oh well you know with this we don't have the money here so we got to put all the money into a quarterback so now you're paying a quarterback almost down there 200 million dollars now you just you give everybody else whatever's just left you know right. so it's it's more so like 
we everybody wants to find a franchise quarterback. Now, realistically, there may be only 10 franchise quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Not 32, but probably 10 true franchise quarterbacks. And it's hard to find that guy and have the and have that. So there's a lot of pressure that I'll put on coaches that with players that they're not comfortable with playing or it may be they don't want to play because that guy hasn't developed yet. So, yeah, you get a lot of pressure from above, but at the same time, that pressure is built on the players too because now that guy may be rushed into something where he thought he had a little more time or it's put on to pressure for the defense to do something that's not realistic. Um, right. So, you know, the expectations that everyone have is to win a Super Bowl. That's expectations, but you get sometimes you go into a locker room expectation where guys we only can give up we only can give up uh, ten points a game or thirteen points up thirteen points a game. All right, well you go against New England and watch they score twenty five. They gonna score twenty five points. You know I've you know I've been in locker rooms where hey man the offense ain't gonna score fourteen points so we got to make sure we got to keep them under ten. You know what I'm saying? So right. I've been in that, I've been in those type of locker rooms. At the end of the day, like. The pressure comes from the players too. I mean, player, players get a lot of pressure put on them because they don't perform right. They're not gonna get paid. They're not, you know what I'm saying? Or they getting cut. And these contracts ain't built for the players. So you know, everyone's putting pressure on themselves rather than just going out and gonna play ball. Like everybody's supposed to. If you coach, just coach. My, do what you gonna do. Whatever comes from above. If you gotta make a change, just make it. Don't don't worry about it. Coach the best of your ability. When they say it ain't working, then it's on them. You know what I'm saying? But I think right. a lot of stuff a lot of stuff is not a lot of pressure is put on us as players and as coaches from a stand from a, from the standpoint of performance and how we perform. Okay. Right. Got you. Got you. So I got one more question for you from, from my from my article and then I also have um some questions from the viewers. Um okay. the last question I'm gonna ask you is going about the, the ten franchise quarterbacks. Say that again. How, how important is it to have a franchise quarterback to win the Super Bowl? Or should I say, do you need a franchise quote unquote quarterback to win the Super Bowl? I do not think you need a franchise quarterback to win the Super Bowl. I mean, hey, look at Trent Dilfer. He won a Super Bowl. He's not he won a franchise quarterback. I mean Brad there's Johnson. A lot, there's the, there's a lot of quarterbacks that's not franchise quarterbacks that win Super Bowls. I mean, Nick Foles won a Super Bowl. Uh, was he? Is he a franchise quarterback? No. It's no. not about the quarterback. It's all about. It's about the guys buying into the system. That's it. Everybody trusts each other. Do your job. Know your job, and go out and go play football. Don't you'll win games. You'll win a lot of games doing that. That's what people fail to understand. People put too much pressure on. Oh, we have to have the franchise quarterback. Now you don't have to have a franchise quarterback to win to win a Super Bowl. I mean, Tom Brady won the franchise quarterback. <laughs> he just fell, he fell into it where Drew Bledsoe got knocked out of the game. Right, Mo Lewis hit him, and he, and he turned into that franchise quarterback. You know what I'm saying? So it's that's what that's what that's that's the things that can happen. You can turn into that franchise quarterback, but I don't necessarily think you need a franchise quarterback to win. A Super Bowl, or basically, to win games at all, you just need a guy that understands the system, understands his limits, and maximize those limits, and play to the best of his ability week in and week out, and give you guys a chance to win. Your defense, if the defense is playing well, and you're scoring points on offense, and you're creating any turnovers on defense, you're gonna win a lot of football games. So right now, it's, it's three days before the draft. You're Brandon Bean, okay? You got picked number 12 and 22. You trading up to get a quarterback, or you filling everything else out? You taking the best two players available? No, I mean, I mean, you guys got picked, what, 12 and you say 22? 22, 12 and 22. Uh, first thing I'm doing, I'm drafting the offensive line. That's the that's the number one thing. I'm, I got to protect my quarterback. If I'm, if I'm losing uh, incognito and now, I have to protect my quarterback. I got to see what I have to try to do to make sure I can protect my quarterback. That second, like I said, that second pick, that's monopoly money. Now I'm just trying to figure out what parts of the, what parts of my of my team I need to fill in. 
because everything else is 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 fill in after that. Every every single draft pick is gonna be fill in. I think you guys have everything you guys need from a secondary to a front line to a linebacker and core. I mean, if you look at last year, your whole secondary was brand new. Right. You had what three new free age uh, free agents and a rookie starter. Yeah. So you can build through free agency, you can build through the draft. But if I'm gonna build through the draft, I'm gonna build young. I'm gonna get guys that I know can go out and go play. And see, this is what I'm I'm not I'm not all into the analytics uh stuff of, of numbers and all that stuff. What I'm into is what a guy put on film. The eye in the sky never lies. I don't care what you play with. I'm gonna study the film, I'm gonna understand the film, I'm gonna understand what a guy can and cannot do. And I'm gonna use that to the best of my ability. And I'm just gonna go off instinct. I'm gonna grade the top forty guys that's in the draft, and that's it. You know, I'm just like, if right. I got two picks, I'm gonna pick two out of the forty that I like, and I'm gonna go from there. And that's, I mean, I, and I think that's just how you have to look at it, because everything after the second round is basically placement guys. But do you also find gems in those areas too? So it's just like. If I get a third round guy that comes in and learns the system and already knows the system as great as some people come in and do, then I, I found a gem. See, people don't use those third round, fourth round picks as oh, you know, I'm, those those draft picks are just depth. That's what they're for. They're, they're cheap and they're depth. That's that's it. Now, like I said, if you find a gem out of one of those, then then you won. Now you like a genius. And that's what it all boils down to. I think people put too much into the numbers aspect of what somebody does number-wise and what they put on this pro football focus stuff. That stuff don't mean nothing to me. I need to see exactly what you do on film, what you do, and how well you do it. If you block well in the run game, you're a great run blocker. But if you trash in the pass game, I can't have you because that's what this NFL is turning into. It's, turn, it's a pass-happy league now. So if it's a pass happy league now, and you're not a great pass blocker, why I want to draft you? Right. So you know if you can, if you're never, if if I'm in a defense where you're never pressed and my defense is pressed, why would I bring you in? I don't give a damn if you're the number one, number two corner in the in the draft. Why would I want you if you don't know how to press or you can't play off coverage? Right. See, it's too many times now. It's like with the rules changed back in 2007. With this, how how many hours kids can have, they don't get they don't get a chance to get coached. You got the twenty hour rule. We used to have forty. They don't give a chance to get coached anymore. They don't get to understand the game. They just throw a guy out there, spread the offense out because we don't have a lot of stuff, and just let the guys play football. That's it. Guys not getting taught. You can't you can't you can't talk to players or a former players can't help another player because oh you're paying for his stuff. That's the NCAA rule is trash. That's, if we're trying to help everybody get to where we need to, let guys get the coaching that they're supposed to get because guys coming to the NFL, first they feel entitled. Then on top of that, they're not very coachable because they don't know, they have never been coached or they don't understand the whole coaching plan of how you're supposed to do it because they don't have many hours for it in the NFL. I'm saying college football. Right. I, I agree. Um, I agree. Like I said, it's definitely something that needs to be done because, like I said, you're wasting a lot. You're wasting a lot of these kids' time, and they're wasting money on the back end, and you're wasting a lot of owners' money on the front end. Yeah. Um, you, you waste you waste a lot of money. But the thing about this, the NFL now is all about getting cheaper. It's not about getting better. If you look at over the last seven or eight years, it's all about making sure. I mean, you have veteran guys that that's a six year that's playing that's playing at a very high level, then don't don't play another year. How is that? Yeah. And can be great can be great locker room guys, but I mean it's playing in their prime and then they don't play anymore? How? How are you not playing but because they found another guy that's cheaper? That can do just about the same thing, but not better, but he's cheaper. Thinking on that point, Des Bryant, he's a free agent. Obviously there's been a lot of rumors about Buffalo being a good fit for him, blah, blah, blah. How do you feel about Des Bryant? In that same realm of NFL getting cheaper, do you feel like that was a the move to get cheaper, or do you feel like that was the right move? I don't. 
who who else, what other guy you have there? Man, that's, we got that that, that can draw the attention. Jet, there's Brian Burns. There's nobody. nobody there. There's nobody there. To me, I, it's a it's a move to send. To me, it's a it's a move that sends a message to everybody. Like none of y'all are safe. I don't care who you are anymore. You're not safe. Um, Dez is still can play at the high. Can uh, to me can play at a very high level. I just think the offense changed when they got Zeke. It was a Dez Bryant offense, and then when Zeke got in, it it came to be a Zeke Elliott offense. He can catch the ball in the backfield. He can run the ball. You know, we can line him up and do this on different stuff. So. It, his targets went down. He didn't underperform. His targets went down, and, and that's what it's all about. It's oh, you know what? Uh, we didn't. You didn't catch the ball that much this year. Well, if you look at his targets, it's totally different from the past two or three years and from this year. See, well, right you, there, that's what's funny because you went against a Sammy Watkins. Mm -hmm. You went against a young Sammy Watkins, and our founder Pierre, he always says that Sammy wasn't bad, but Sammy didn't get the targets. When you look at the targets that um, a Julio Jones, a Mike Evans, or Odell Beckham was getting because they were in the same class as far as the Beckham and Evans again, yeah. they got almost 60 more targets a season. But that's also the quarterback. Right. See what I'm saying? It's also the quarterback. So if you got a bad, if you have a bad quarterback that can't get him the ball or, you know what I'm saying, like you, 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 the targets are not there. If your quarterback is not standing upright, the targets are not there. If your quarterback is getting hurt and throw the ball and the ball is supposed to go to him, the targets are not there. You know, you can have plays designed. I mean, trust me, there have been plenty of plays designed for Sammy. But when Fitz didn't have time or Tyrod Taylor didn't have time, it wasn't going there. Now, when he had time and they missed him, that's on them. That's not, that's not on Sammy. I, can't, I mean, to me, I thought Sammy was, to me, I, I mean, me covering Sammy and understanding Sammy, it was totally different because I understood what routes he can run and what routes he couldn't run. That's another thing. If you're a one, if you're a one trick pony, then you can't really do nothing. You know, to me, I knew Sammy was an underneath guy, deep ball guy, and that was it. He couldn't run a comeback. He couldn't run a curl. He was going to run slants. He was going to run digs. And he was gonna run a nine route. He's gonna run an over route on play action, boot, whatever it may be, and that was it. You understood the routes combination, you know what you're gonna get from him. But to get rid of him at a young guy, 24, 25 years old, I don't see it. That can still run, that can open up, that can open up the underneath stuff. I don't see it. I would have did the same thing that Pittsburgh used to do with Mike Wallace. I'm gonna run him deep, run him deep, run him deep. And then I'll give him the ball when the cornerback thing I ain't, when the when the cornerback thing I'm not finna throw it to him. Because everything else is up open underneath. Everybody's too worried about Sammy running over the top of him. Well, and you know, look at this team last year in the receiving core. Nothing against KB and nothing against Zay Jones, but you saw Tyrod Taylor was very uncomfortable when he didn't have that deep threat to open up the field for him more because he wouldn't throw the ball in general in any tight windows, and it just compacted the field even more. Yeah, I mean that's you how you get to sixty-five passing yards in a game. Yeah, I mean, but you also missed the hell out of uh, what's the guy named uh, Marquise? Goodwin. You miss, you miss, you miss good. You miss Goodwin. You miss, you know, it's a lot of guys that can open up that that can open up underneath to throw the ball downfield. If you get that single high safety, you know you're going outside with those speed with the speed boys. So I mean, it's just understanding that you don't have that. Now KB to me is a guy that can. That's a big red zone target. Underneath third down guy, that's that's KB, but he's played as the number one receiver the last what four or five years? That last four years, yeah. So I mean, you can't take that away from him. You know, he's he's not a deep ball threat. It reminds me a lot. He's just a to me, he's a bigger version of Anquan Bolden. That's a good that's a good comparison. That's that's who he, he that's who he reminds me of. He plays just like him. And he's not gonna run away from you, but what he is gonna do, he's gonna separate. He's gonna, he knows how to use his body to separate. All right. So, when you played, who was the toughest receiver that you can remember guard that you had to cover? Toughest receiver to me was Brandon Marshall, hands down. 
Um, I mean, I faced him 12 times in my career. Eight times when we was both in San Diego and he was in Denver. So, I mean, playing against him, I mean, you know him, you know him, but you know, it's always it's always that that mindset of going into it. Well, I know I got me a headache today, so I'm make sure I bring my my hard hat, my tail pan, and and, and everything else. Yeah, because <laughs> I knew what I was gonna get. So, uh, to me, that was because I played him so many times. He was the hardest receiver I had to face up against. Wow. Yeah, B. Marsh, man. I, you know, I still remember him in college when he had that, or he was with the NFL. He had the twenty-two catch game. Yeah, against Andy. So he had the week before. He had eighteen on us. Yeah. He had he had nine on me in the touchdown. That was uh, two thousand eight. I, you think I, I remember that game because I had just came off my. Uh, I had just fractured. Well, I didn't know I fractured my hip. Uh, but I had just came off my hip injury in week one against Carolina. We played them in week two, and I'm just like, man, all right. Hip hurt, I'm about to go in. I don't care what what's going on. I'm just going to play ball. Man, he caught like 10 passes on him. 10 out of the 18 passes in the touchdown, right before halftime. I was so pissed, man. So pissed. He caught his first 10 catches on me in the first half. He didn't catch another ball in the second half, though. I'm just like, man, why I couldn't do this the first half? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but you have those games, though, man. But that's what makes it so fun. Like, man, him can sit back and laugh about it now because, you know, we, we know – we knew what we went into every single week that we played each other. Right. Oh uh, man, was, I mean, man, I think we we pretty much we covered a lot of it, man. We covered a lot of things today. I think um definitely thank you for coming on, man. For man, sure, no problem, man. No problem. We definitely going. We definitely going. We gonna link again. We are gonna do this again, man. Um, man I, hey, I ain't got no problem doing it. Tell you want to talk football, man. I'm here, man. Yeah. So um, one more thing, man. Give us a memory about playing in Buffalo. Man, let me tell you, <laughs> the first time I played in Buffalo, this is my rookie year. This is when, uh, what's the receiver from Wisconsin? Evan, Lee. Lee Evans, okay. I mean, the biggest thing, I mean, I think Lee Evans was there. I forgot who was the other receiver that was there, 2006. Uh, was it Peerless Price? Peerless Price, yeah. Peer, Peerless was here. Okay, we had so, Lee Evans here. Mo. So it's, the Moles, so got, right? Huh? Was it Moles was gone already? Why right? Eric Moles was gone, think, right? It, yeah, he was gone. I think it was just um, uh, it was uh, Lee Evans and Peerless Price. Those are the only two receivers I remember. Man, so coming into this game, man, it's the first time I ever played in Buffalo. First time I ever had a cold game. And by far the coldest game I gave. But I remember at the it was like towards the end of the game we were we were winning. And they threw a pass to peel this price in the end zone. Man, I ain't even try to attempt to jump for the ball. That's how cold I was. Man, it it was like, man, I was just trying to push him out of bounds. I thought I got him out of bounds, man. Peel this price somehow scraped his feet on the back of the back of the pylon. I'm just like, man, this can't this can't be serious, man. It's it's 22 degrees. I mean, it's like it's probably like 13 degrees outside too, man. I was like, and it was snowing. Man, I'm a Florida boy, man. I, I ain't never good with no cold weather like that, man. <laughs> I was like, man, I hope we never got to play Buffalo again. And two years later, we was right back in Buffalo in 2008, man. I was like, man, this is bull crap. <laughs> no one again. I say, man, well, being in this hot weather comes to this cold, it's not right for nobody. But no, nah, man, the I think the biggest thing, man, about Buffalo, man, it's the fans, man. Like, it's 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 a college atmosphere in Buffalo, man. That's that's the one thing I remember the most. Just like playing there and feeling how crazy the crowd is going, man. No matter how cold it is outside, and they're true fans, man. And there ain't no, oh, I'm gonna leave because the game almost over with. Nah, we gonna stick it out. If you're a fan, you're a fan. I don't give a damn how much somebody getting blown out. We gonna sit right here in these stands, and we gonna, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna sit here because this is our team. I just like this past year, I'm watching the game with the snowfall. I was and there, people, bro. I'm like, man, I, <laughs> if I'm a fan, I'm not going. Hey, I watch y'all on the tube, brother. I'm not going. But it's just like, man, that's what you want, man. Like you guys, like 
the Buffalo fans to me are some of the best fans ever. It goes for me. It goes. I love Buffalo fans and the KC fans. Pittsburgh has got some hella fire fans too. Like those are my three top people. Like from fan wise, like the the loyal the loyalty. The, you know what I'm saying? Like that that speaks volume. You know, and it's no matter how, what the record is for Buffalo, no matter what, that stadium is always filled. Yeah, and that just that just speaks volumes from what guys believe and what their the hopes and the dreams of the getting back to the Super Bowl and the getting back into the playoffs and you know having that continue to try to build on the legacy that was built from Jim Kelly and all those guys, Thurman Thomas and all those guys. You know, and, and just and just keep it going, man. And that's what it's really all about. So that's my most my you know what I remember the most about being a Buffalo is the fans, man. It's it's just it's love. Hey, man, we love our team. About. We love our team. But before we get out of here, man, I know you. I know. I know you're not putting your cleats in the field right now, but I know you just took your your hand in the TV world, man. So uh, yeah. Let yeah, man, we're in the TV world, man. So if, if, if everybody that's going to be watching, that is watching right now, uh, May 8th, man, uh, is our if, uh, is our premiere of our, well, our, our second part of our first season, uh, May 8th on USA Network. You guys, tune in, man. Enjoy it. It's about family and fun, man. And, man, you'll get to see some of my kids, man. You know, and that's what it's all about. We're just trying to show up. Uh, a, a true family atmosphere. But not only that, if you guys are watching, we we the first African Americans that's on this, uh, that's ever been on USA to have a show. So you know that's that's one of the big accomplishments. So yeah, my cleats are down, but my tennis shoes are running. That's it. <laughs> so man, kudos to you, kudos to USA for for doing that, man. Get together. I'm definitely gonna tune in. I'm pretty sure a lot Appreciate of the Buffalo it. fanatics and Buffalo fans will tune into the show. Um. But we're going to do this again, man. This ain't man, it. We got to do it again, man. We, we can definitely do it. Let's, man, you know what? Let's, let, let's, let's make it now. Let's do the Jets and Buffalo game this year, man. Let's do a recap of the Jets-Buffalo game this year. Man, you got a date, man. Definitely. We're going to do it again. Let's do it, man. Let's, let's, when, let's look at the schedule, pick which game you want to do, and we, we can do it, man. All right, man. Definitely, for sure. Thanks, right. bro. Appreciate it, Buffalo JT. JTM, I'm out. Don't forget, FSU, DBU, we in the building. All, All, All right. All right. All day, man. All right. Thank I, you, man, I, once man. again. We'll do it again. Buffalo Fanatics, man. Appreciate you.